So I think you guys would agree that I've been incredibly upfront over the past 12 years that there are certain cars that are more important at their introduction than other vehicles. The list includes, but is not limited to, the Chevrolet Corvette, of course the Porsche 911, and absolutely the Mercedes-Benz SL class. Now, why do I say this? Well, first reason, these cars are changed once every eight to 10 years. Second reason, which is far more important, the changes that these vehicles bring to the market, it's not so much about what's contained within their respective vehicles, it's the fact that these changes dictate the future of the segments these cars compete in, even other segments for up to 10 years. So in essence, what you're trying to do here is predict the future. Not exactly easy, but what if you try to do something on top of that? Like in this case, this was an entirely new car, but it didn't replace one car, it replaced two different cars. So now that we understand all that, our simple task today is to determine if Mercedes-Benz is predicting the future while simultaneously pulling a rabbit out of a hat yet again. Now, admittedly, the preamble you and I just went through is certainly a way to raise expectations of the new SL, but in reality, what I'm trying to convey are the many changes that are going on underneath the new roof. And to understand that, we have to start with what hasn't changed, and that would be the engine, at least in the first year of production. There are two on offer. In reality, I think it's only one. It's a four liter twin turbocharged V8. It's on offer in two different tunes. It's an SL55 which makes do with a measly 469 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque. However, that is not the car we are driving today. We'll drive that in a future episode. We are driving the SL63, which is 577 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of torque. Now that we got that out of the way, what are some of the changes going on here? To understand one of the biggest, we have to understand the transmission that is in the vehicle. We've driven the wet multi-clutch that AMG puts behind these four liter twin turbocharged V8s. Well, that is now driving not just the rear wheels, it is driving all four wheels. Then we get into the structure of the vehicle. This is completely new and something you need to understand, the chief engineer of this vehicle He's also the chief engineer of the AMG GT. Now, they've gone on and on before they showed us the SL that they share no parts. The new SL and the AMG GT, there's nothing in common. They even brought the naked structure of the vehicle. They flew it all the way over from Germany. And some of the things that I learned from it, it's made of more exotic materials. It's not just like steel, it's high strength steel and aluminum in different parts. So the idea is to make it more lightweight, although this is not really a lightweight vehicle. But then there's the size of the vehicle. It's very different in size from the SL that came before it, as well as the AMG GT. It's five inches longer in wheelbase than the SL it replaces. And as a basis of comparison, that's 10 inches longer in wheelbase than a Porsche 911. Okay, so if you and I are reading the tea leaves correctly, Mercedes-Benz seems to be very serious about separating out this SL and the future AMG GT. But there is one thing that they have pilfered from the AMG GT, and that is dynamic engine mounts, which is new to the SL. Then there are the performance figures. That's something that's very interesting for a car of this size. Zero to 60, 3.5 seconds. VMAX, 196 miles an hour. So before you and I dive off too far into today's subject matter, which for the avoidance of doubt has a folding roof, I feel compelled to call out the obvious. The sky has opened, and on my way to this specific road, I passed a man with a long beard, a big boat, and a lot of animals. 4,178 pounds, or depending on expression weights and measures, 1,895 kilograms. Now, in terms of reference, the SL55, that one's only 50 pounds lighter, but 911 turbo convertible, that's about 3,800 pounds with that. Okay, here we go. And this, oh God, this thing is, it's fast. Uh, too fast for this road and really for this weather. But it's the overall size of the vehicle that for lack of a better term, cloaks how immediate the power is delivered here. Make no mistake, very fast car, 
but a very fast GT car. Now, somewhat related to the propulsion system, there's a neat bit of tech on offer here, and it falls under the heading of active aero. Now, yeah, there's the spoiler in the back, which goes up or down and pivots based on the speed of the vehicle, but that's more of an impact on driving dynamics. This falls under the heading of like the active shutters we've seen in economy cars where they're trying to drive efficiency, at least airflow through the engine. Here they go a step further where they have the active shutters in the front of the vehicle in the rather stunning Pan America grill that they've had in old Mercedes throughout the years. Here it's adapted for this vehicle. What they've done is added another shutter system underneath the engine compartment. So there's a shutter that can open or close from underneath the vehicle. It's a trade-off between managing airflow around the vehicle and then airflow, meaning cooling, throughout that power plant. And just think about the architecture of it. Yeah, it's a twin turbo V8, but the turbochargers sit in the V, the catalytic converters sit right behind it. So it tries to get the temperature up as quickly as possible to get it to the most efficient operating point but that means it needs more cooling at all operating speeds. Okay, now let's you and I press on to the biggest headline of the new SL, and that is the way it drives. It's a multi-link unit up front as well in the back, but instead of four link, it's five link. Then in the SL55, it's got steel springs. However, the SL63, that has what they call an airmatic suspension, but it's not like in the SUVs. This is oil. It's not an air ride. It's not something that bounces up and down like those SUVs. So think of it, it's closer to like an off-road damper where it has an overflow reservoir, and there are four of them. There's one at each corner. There's a base amount of pressure. So like in the comfort mode, it's something like 18 bar. However, in the Sport Plus mode, which we're in now, it's 45 bar. And then it adjusts the dampers based on the situation. Now, something that absolutely needs to be said. This does not drive like a GT. It doesn't have that same flat cornering feel. This, it has an unusual amount of squat in the back and something tells me that's the weight and the length of the vehicle working against it. There is good control over the pitch, the side to side. And if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, that has everything to do with the ride height. And the SL63s, they ride 10 mils lower, so a trick stolen from the folks at Porsche. Now, as it relates to the steering, there is one bit of information that I have chosen to sandbag you on, at least up until this point of the episode. And that's the fact that all SLs, 55, 63s, are fitted with rear wheel steering as standard. Now, is that earth shattering? No, we've driven many performance cars that have rear wheel steering. What's different here is the execution. Now we learned in the W223S class, Mercedes-Benz, they've gone to another level where it's 10 degrees of rear wheel steering in that vehicle, but there it needs it because it's a 122 inch wheelbase and it makes that car in a parking lot like a Honda Civic. This, it doesn't need that much steering in the back. It's about what, two and a half, 2.6 degrees of steering. What's different here is the speed, the line of demarcation where the rear wheels either turn in the opposite direction as the front wheels or in the same direction. Now that's normally, in other performance cars, it's in what, anywhere between say 35 and 50 miles an hour. This is all the way up at 62 miles an hour. And as best as I could figure it, this system is much more focused on high speed stability. It's noticeable for a vehicle that is a 106 inch wheelbase. It makes a difference over other vehicles that are this long. And while we're talking about bad weather, we gotta get to the other elephant in the room and that's the all wheel drive system. Here, I can't honestly tell you that there is a difference in the steering in terms of you feel a difference in the way the vehicle steers because the front wheels are fighting, well, we wanna go that way, or we wanna go that way. Instead, the system it clearly feels like most of the torque is going to the rear wheels. Then you and I need to touch briefly on ride quality. This thing, it's not about a luxury car feel. It does not have a luxury car feel, but it is more compliant than an AMG GT. It's not something you get behind the wheel and say, oh yeah, this is a direct competitor to a Porsche 911. That is not at all the case. So, uh, yeah, hate to disappoint you again, but no, it's not that time to play your favorite game on the options game, because once again, we have a contestant, but no pricing. You see, Mercedes-Benz, they flew the cars over from Germany, but they did not fly over any pricing. So what you and I are going to do is take the build sheet I have in the car we are driving, 
and guesstimate the pricing. Now, to start that, we should look at the last time an SL63 was sold in the US, and that was 2019, which, yeah, that's like eons ago, especially in the world of inflation. That was $155,000, a bargain. I'm guessing this, like, I think if there was a gift von Stuttgart, it would be about 160,000 US. However, if I'm putting my money on what this thing is gonna be, I think we should look to the 911, the 992 Turbo, not the S. That convertible is $180,000. Then there are the factory options fitted to this car, and we have to start with that Manufactura Manza Grey Magno. Santa Maria, Madre de Dios. Can I just say, I got a friend at Mercedes, because before I got to the program, I said, hey man, can you set me up with like a color that pops? And wow, did this thing pop. I got there early and took the car out for a drive when it wasn't raining to get all that B-roll. I'm guessing it's gotta be at least five grand. Then normally I'm not a huge fan of black interiors, but the black Napa with the microfiber and the red contrast stitch, that actually did work in this car. Maybe I'd want like a two-tone in there. I'm guessing that's probably a $1,500 option. Then there's the AMG carbon fiber trim for the interior. From what I remember, this was about a $1,500 to an $1,800 option. Then the 21-inch cross-spoke black wheels. I, I gotta believe they're four grand. Uh, then we go to the red soft top. I hope that is not an extra charge, but man, oh man, does it work here. And then I have to say, whoever spec this car had a very keen eye because they didn't stop with the red just on the top. The red seat belts, that's probably a $500 option. Then the AMG Aero package, so that changes the front and rear of the car. I gotta believe it's a $2,000 to $2,500 option. And then there's another carbon fiber package fitted to this car. So the one we just talked about is the inside, this one for the outside. Now, previous AMGs we've driven, there's usually been one or two that are on offer, basically one for the lower part of the car and one for like the, the mirror housings. I'm guessing there's only one on this car. It's probably about $3,000. Then the extended night package. Now for the avoidance of doubt, these are on offer in two different flavors. There's a touring and there's a performance line. The performance line adds the night package as standard. However, one can say, no, I don't want the night package and still get the performance. Thank you very much. This basically adds just more black. I'm guessing this is about $1,000. Then of course, the Burmester stereo. Previously, this has been anywhere between three and $5,000. And we have to go back to that performance line. That adds really a couple of important things. So all of these, whether it's a basic SL63 or an SL63 performance, that has all of the touring items, like the head-up display, as well as the very flash augmented reality navigation system we've experienced in many other Mercedes-Benz vehicles. Now that we have the touring spec out of the way, what makes up the performance spec? Well, the first item, that is somewhat curious. It's the front axle lift system. Now, if you speak to the chief engineer, they say the front axle lift system is a function of the air ride, which is fitted to the SL63 as standard. Okay, I get it, but being this thing is going to have base price of 160,000 to 180,000, can't you do us all a favor and make it fitted to standard? Yeah, I see you'd make some more money if we damage your cars and you'd sell more parts, but in reality, it would be so much goodwill to customers not having to deal with body shops. And now that I have made that humble request, let's press on to the most important aspect of the performance spec. And this is something that has been staring you in the face throughout this entire episode, which would be those Recaro-esque seats. And all I'm going to say, absolutely transforms the experience as well as the interior, which brings us to what we think this vehicle will cost. And here, all I'm gonna say is, north of 200,000. First with that roof, which for the avoidance of doubt, I actually prefer this because it works in conjunction with the overall design of the vehicle, especially that it doesn't have the bows, it doesn't have the hungry cow look. What they've done here is made a three layer soft top that folds in a Z pattern. And what that means is that it stores in the vehicle a lot more compact than a hard top roof. Then there's the usability of the roof with the roof up. And obviously I've had a lot of time to do that today. 
Uh, there, the three layers do make a difference. It kind of sounds like a coupe. Then something that's not all puppy dogs and roses, and that's how do you put the roof up and down? Well, there's a button. It's here. You can't distinguish it from all the other buttons that are haptic feedback and no tactile feel. This one, you press it once, and it goes to this screen thing here where it shows you a picture of the car, and then you press and hold this, and the top goes up or down. Now, I'm not going to do it today for obvious reasons. Now, that, when I first saw it, I thought that was the only way to open the car. That, not good. Should be verboten, because I want, like, a lever. And that's what they've done for many years. Mercedes like had this like big honking aluminum lever that has tactile feel. Let's do that. Let's go back to that. The other option without doing that is press this twice. So press it a second time and hold it. The roof will come down. Can we change that? Uh, then does the overall space or really what this feels like on the inside of the vehicle. And I would argue now that I've spent some time driving and I've driven this thing like almost 300 miles today, that back seat, we talked about it in the previous episode, it's for a very occasionally used for people you want to torture, but I would say it's more about the open airiness of this vehicle. That's one of the reasons why I like 911 so much. Yeah, the back seat's there, it's completely useless, but it feels more like a, a personal car from back in the day. But enough of the back seat, because in reality, that is indeed going to be open to personal interpretation. And speaking of personal interpretation, we need to have a very frank discussion about the gauges or lack thereof in this vehicle. Now, I get it. All the kids nowadays, they want screens. All the car manufacturers, they want screens. Why? Because it's cheap. But this, it's not a cheap vehicle. And if there is any Mercedes that absolutely requires old school dials with needles, this would be it. And preferably, something that looks like it came from IWC and Schaffhausen. Now, somewhat related to this screen is this screen, and there they have introduced a party trick. No, it's not all the applications and the screens that I've shown you here. Rather, it's the way the screen can pivot. Now, think this is a convertible that has, what, a 12.3-inch diagonal screen here. That's the size of an iPad. There would be glare. They've taken that into account, and there's a button over here to change the angle so it can reduce the glare. Okay, so what have we learned today? Well, the first thing we should acknowledge is that Mercedes-Benz has indeed once again pulled a rabbit out of a hat. The only catch is, I don't know if everybody's gonna like this rabbit. Now, I for one like a rabbit that has a folding soft top and a longer wheelbase. But here's the thing, all of the changes people are fussed about, the only work to make the vehicle so much better, which brings us to the wish list. And here's the thing you should be worried about, the differentiation between the AMG GT and the SL, because you know they're not gonna kill the AMG GT because that fights a 911, this really doesn't. So if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, the fact that the same chief engineer of this is the chief engineer of the AMG GT, something tells me that by all the investment, like you look at that platform, that the naked platform we saw in this episode today, you don't put that kind of money in a car unless you are going to put some sort of development and make it different in the car that's somewhat similar to it. If I'm wrong, please take this as the wish list and make sure you make that the reality because two cars this close, at least the way they are right now, they're too close. Anyway, this is my point of the episode where I turn this around to you guys to apply in the comments below or via social media, Motoman TV on Word, Motoman TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And rather than complaining about how frustrating the YouTube algorithm is, all I'm going to say is we put a hell of a lot of work in these episodes and would love your help in getting them out there. So we see you in the next episode. Bish beta.